Land is the center of life to native people. Most of our land has been taken and few of our people remain. In 1974, Congress passed a law ordering 10,000 Navajo off their land. Land, the government says, belongs to the Hopi tribe. Congress has ordered the Navajo to move by 1986, despite the protests of the traditional Hopi and Navajo people. Chairman, I'm here today to discuss the tragedy of relocating over 9,000 of my tribal people from the native homeland. More than 75% of the Navajo relocatees will be condemned to a life of misery, poverty, and alienation. Just how would you have any income if you're forced to, to move? Uh, do you have any other way of making a living other than livestock raising? I make my living with the sheep. You don't have to carry them on your back, you just herd them. This is how I live. I will not relocate. If I were offered a new home, I would be a stranger in such a place. I wouldn't know how to operate the heating or the lighting system. And the expense, I'm sure, would be tremendous. How would I pay for these utilities? I have no income and have never been to any school. Assuming we go through with this destructive effort, how and where would she be relocated on the Navajo reservation? Senator DeConcini, there is no place on the Na present Navajo reservation to which she can relocate to carry on the way of life that she has described. The United States government created reservations for the Navajo and Hopi tribes more than a century ago. Navajo lived near the Hopi villages long before the reservation line was drawn and the government allowed them to stay until now. Today, the government is spending one half billion dollars to partition the Hopi reservation between the two tribes and to move the Navajo out of the Hopi half. Most of the Navajo are being moved into border towns hundreds of miles from their homeland. Before moving, I was living very well. The sheep and the cows were like a bank. It was good when I relied on them. Now I fall into hunger. My shoes are all worn out, and that is the truth. Here I'm told to pay for everything, even the water. I owe taxes, too. I just suffer from all the bills. 11, 19 is your thing. 10, 11, and 19, 10. Thank you. Have a nice day now. When Hastin learned that his Hogan had been deliberately burned down, he suffered a stroke. While he was in the hospital, his tracked house was repossessed for non-payment of taxes and utility bills. There is no word for relocation in the Navajo language. To relocate is to disappear and never be seen again. The old people of the earth tell stories. An old woman of the old ways, she said, I Joy 
extraordinary group of Americans uh, whose culture is fading. It's under all sorts of pressures, uh, which is attempting to adapt gradually, which is making all sorts of compromises subject to all sorts of stress, um, that now through this act of Congress is being, it's being terminated. It's being invalidated. It's being forced to get off its center, the land. That's, that's the integrating principle of the culture. And I say, why? Enormous quantities of minerals are buried here. On the Navajo reservation alone lie 100 million barrels of oil, 25 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, 80 billion pounds of uranium, and 50 billion tons of coal, by conservative estimates. The energy corporations want the resources under Indian land, and if necessary, the native people will be sacrificed. Since before human memory, winds and waters have sculpted this sacred Indian land and shaped the landscape like no other on earth. For 150,000 moons, Indian prayers have bonded the land and sky. This was home, first for the Anasazi, stargazers and architects of antiquity. The Anasazi designed the blueprint for civilization in North America. Their descendants, the Hopi, are the oldest culture surviving today. The word Hopi means peace, and the Hopi have been a people of peace for thousands of years. The Hopis are a Pueblo people who live in villages atop the mesas that lie within the center of this disputed area. For centuries, they remained close to the mesas. They farm plots in outlying areas, never going very far from the mesas because they always needed to be able to return to the villages to participate in the ceremonial life of the tribe. The Hopi have always lived with religion as the heart of their culture, the axis around which all life turns.
They have synchronized their energies to the rhythms of the universe. Their rituals are as highly developed as the most intricate mathematical equations. Seeing the world through Hopi eyes is seeing the world in balance. A thousand years ago, the Navajo, or Dene as they call themselves, migrated into the southwest. According to their mythology, the Navajo came into existence through a circular opening called the Emergence Place. They settled within the four sacred mountains with the Hopi at the center. They, along with the Hopi, believed they were placed here to be caretakers of Mother Earth and to protect the sacred center of the continent. When the Navajo first came into the Southwest, they were hunters and gatherers moving with the seasons, living in simple shelters in small family groups. The Navajo Nation was a loose association of families and clans. They became shepherds. The Navajo believe that the sheep are gifts from the holy people. When it's cold and dark with snow, you wrap yourself up. And instead of forgetting the sheep, you stand by them with your teeth chattering. Long ago it was said, if your fingernails are frostbitten and your toenails are fallen off from herding sheep, only then do your sheep belong to you. With the wool from the sheep, the Navajo developed the art of weaving. Their rugs became their primary source of income in the modern world. The Navajo learned how to farm the desert from the Hopi, and corn became an important part of their lives. With farming, the people became rooted. They built permanent shelters called hogans, which opened to the east to greet the sun. I was born where there were no enclosures, and everyone drew a free breath. Big Mountain is a shrine to the Navajo who built their homes around its base. The people here are all related by blood, clan, or marriage. For generations, they have passed the land down from mother to daughter. Until now, half the Big Mountain people have been ordered to relocate. <laughs> I'm a woman from Big Mountain. In our minds, we love this mountain very much. From the beginning, it was put here for us. I have children. I have a husband. I have the continuing generations of my family. This land must not be stolen from the coming generations. What my older people say is right. And a way for us to have our culture keep on going and not to forget what our ancestors have brought to us. These ways were put here with us. 
We shake the pollen from the corn plant and offer it to the sun. The Holy Spirit protects us. We pray for ourselves in this way. The Navajo elders know the properties of plants and herbs, how to prepare them for different purposes. They know how to use crystals and prayers for healing, how to use planets and stars in planting. This is the heritage they pass down to their children in the sacred circle of life. The juice from these berries will cure your eyes if they're irritated. These berries are also used to make dyes. The dyes that belong to the white man color the wool right away. But with this, you have to let it sit for a long time before it will do that. These true elders, they, they don't need money to live. So, like sometimes they say money, to us money is nothing. Then they don't care for modern things like new materials or nice homes. They don't care for those because they know that, that those won't last long. This grinding stone was put here for us a long time ago. Washington does not recognize these ways. If he were to look at these things, he would think them of no value. But to us they are holy. Washington says, go away, go someplace else. Go walk among people in places you don't know. We are not hard enough to survive in places that we are unfamiliar with. If we leave here, we'll grieve for our homeland, and it'll kill us. It's almost as if they've lost a portion of their soul when they no longer can return to, to that land. The land that has really defined them to themselves, their connection to their family, to the, to the livestock, to the shrines, to the mountains that are around them. Um, if they lose this, then they are losing the thing that is most precious to them, which we might call our soul. I really wish that Navajo leaders and Navajo people generally would take a look at this and say we don't like it. Uh, it's rotten, it, uh, it's unfair, we wish they had done it some other way. But we're Americans like everyone else, and we can uh, change if we have to, and we'll find some more land that our kids will think is just as good as this land, and get on with it. I don't know who these white people are. Now here they come from someplace across the water, and now they're telling everyone what to do. Indians have been paying with their lives for the white man's greed since the arrival of Columbus. White settlers moving west considered the land theirs for the taking. They demanded the Indians be killed or confined. An officer in the United States Cavalry wrote, By the colonization and subjugation of the Navajo tribe, we gain for civilization their whole country. There is evidence of gold fields, of veins of silver, and the richest copper. I have come to kill Indians, and I believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven. Colonel Kit Carson burned Navajo crops, slaughtered Navajo livestock, and murdered innocent people. The 8,000 Navajo that survived were herded across the New Mexican desert in winter. Hundreds perished along the way, the old, the young, the helpless. 
Those that couldn't walk any further were left to die in the snow. The survivors called this the long walk. They called their destination the place of suffering. 80 years later, the Nazis would study these internment camps for Indians to design their concentration camps for Jews. No shelter was provided. They dug holes in the ground and covered themselves with branches. They were given coffee and flour. They boiled the unfamiliar coffee beans, threw out the coffee, and ate the beans. They died of dysentery, hunger, and despair. They begged to be allowed to go home. The Navajos' captivity ended when the taxpayers protested. It cost a million dollars a year to keep them captive. In 1868, Congress signed a treaty with the chiefs of the tribe. The Navajo were restricted to a reservation. They promised to send their children to government schools and to give up fighting forever. In exchange, they were released and given two sheep each. Somehow they survived. Their few sheep became large herds. The women developed the art of weaving rugs for trade with the whites. The men developed their silver making skills to craft fine jewelry. They kept their word and gave up the life of the warrior. As their population grew and their herds expanded, the Navajo spread out across the land. No one explained to the Navajo exactly where their reservation was, and there were no boundary markers on this desert land. The concept of being restricted was as alien to the Navajo as partitioning the air or owning a star. Some Navajo returned to the land they had occupied before captivity, near the Hopi villages of Black Mesa. The Hopi accepted the return of their Navajo neighbors as long as they didn't take land the Hopi themselves were using. This area, the Four Corners area, is set aside as a refuge for all uh, native people and other people who want to live in peace. The peace the Hopi wanted was not to be. The United States military occupied Hopi land. They sent bureaucrats and allowed missionaries to control the peaceful Hopis. The BIA agent, the Bureau of Indian Affairs official, was in fact the law on the, the scene. And uh, they set the rules as to what Indians did or didn't do and what their religions, religious practices were or weren't and so forth. The, the idea was to take the culture and rip it out of the Hopi people. And hundreds of miles away, the children would be trucked to uh, boarding schools where they would stay for great periods of time, have their hair cut, their names changed, forbidden to speak Hopi, forced to speak English, forced to attend Christian services, denied the right to practice their Hopi religions, etc. As I grew up, I began to take notice that um, there were um, white people among us, you know, a few of them among us, and, and the uh, people our parents used to say to to run when you see a bahana coming, you know, they'll grab you and take you to school. They had to hire the army to come and get us and take us to Kim's Canyon, which is a boarding school. And we stayed there for many years without ever coming home, and then we were older. And we sort of grew away from our people, you know. When the Hopis resisted this passively, they were summarily treated as criminals. There are documents in the archives which will show you photographs of whole groups of Hopi leaders hauled off to Alcatraz on the uh, conviction of the local BIA agent. To consolidate federal control over the Hopi, the government agent drew an arbitrary rectangle on a map depriving the Hopi of millions of acres they had considered their own. With the stroke of a pen, the Hopi, like the Navajo, became wards of the federal government. You know, that's the historical legal framework that led to this present dispute. The idea that the federal government can give and take Indian land willy-nilly as it sees fit, with no 
legal restraint whatsoever. Those lands weren't the lands of the United States uh, uh, with which to do as they pleased. Those were native people's lands. And I think the problems that we're now seeing would not have arisen had it not been for the conduct of the United States in those times. There were 500 Navajo living inside the Hopi reservation when it was formed. The government not only allowed them to stay, but also encouraged more and more Navajo to move into the Hopi reservation. As far as I can remember, uh, the Navajos have uh, come into our area and uh, they've brought in wood and they bring mutton and uh, we uh, trade with them and we, we trade our corn and beans, melon, things like that. And uh, so we are dependent on each other for our livelihood. In 1884, the Indian agent wrote, The best of good feelings generally exists between these two tribes. They constantly mingle at festivals, dances, and feasts. It was these dances that first drew white curiosity seekers to Hopi land. In August of each year, when the earth was dry and cracked, the Hopi priest prayed for rain with rattlesnakes in their teeth. If the Hopi had been living in a humble way, the rains would come. The Hopi tried to teach the white Americans to respect the power of their ways. But their ceremonies, which echoed the archaic womb of human consciousness, resonated from a depth that few whites could comprehend. While the Hopi prayed for and with nature, the whites were hell-bent on conquering her. The completion of the Santa Fe Railroad accelerated the white man's penetration into Indian territory. The trains brought with them alcohol and diseases to which the Indians had no resistance. Small towns sprung up. Homesteaders and prospectors began settling on Indian lands. The influx of white settlers caused conflicts with the Navajo, whose own population had expanded rapidly. To protect the settlers and the Navajo from one another, the government was forced to expand the Navajo reservation until it completely surrounded the Hopi reservation. Having confined the Indians to land he thought worthless, the white man discovered that beneath the tangle of corn plant roots lay vast quantities of oil. Mining companies pressured the Department of the Interior to set up tribal consuls on the reservations, which could then sign leases on behalf of the tribes. The first Navajo tribal council was hand-picked by the Secretary of the Interior and was forbidden to meet except in his presence. The tribal council was established in the 1920s to sign contracts on behalf of the Navajo people for energy development, for oil development at that time. And ever since, the attitude of political leaders in Phoenix and in the rest of Arizona has been that the purpose of tribal government is to go along with whatever programs are proposed. It was not set up to serve the Navajo people. It was so that there would be a formal way, an official way, of having endorsements for development of Navajo land. The Navajo tribal government to this day operates as a corporation. It does not have the welfare of people as the purpose for which it exists. To solidify control over both tribes, the BIA set up a Hopi tribal council. The Hopi already had a system of government through which they had lived in peace for thousands of years. The traditional leaders protested. We do not accept or recognize the tribal council and we will never work with them because our work as Hopi 
traditional and religious leaders, we go through our ceremonies and other religious activity, and we sincerely believe that we are taking care of all living things on this earth, all people. This is our work. So we cannot follow that other system and create trouble for any person. The uh, vote by which the Constitution was supposedly adopted was uh, a vote by only a tiny minority of the Hopi people. It was conducted in an atmosphere characterized by all kinds of fraud and deception and trickery on the part of the Interior Department and those who supported them. Oliver Lafarge, who conducted the election for the government, later confessed to the injustice he himself had perpetrated on the Hopi people. The Hopis have been operated on by everybody from Coronado to Kit Carson to Oliver Lafarge. In almost every case, they've suffered for it. Why they should ever trust another white man is a mystery to me. Oil leasing underway, the BIA began seizing Hopi and Navajo livestock. To discourage overgrazing, the government killed or confiscated more than half a million Navajo livestock. Many animals were shot and left to die near the people who had cared for them. Washington says, whatever my wish, it is to be obeyed. That's the only thing that Washington stands for. But his plans are no good, and so today we will starve. The grass became worse after stock reduction, and because of new government grazing restrictions, the people were not allowed to move around in search of better grass. Each family settled in one place and tried to hang on to as much land as possible. They were becoming more like white people, each one saying, this is my land, go away. Many Navajo were forced to leave the land. To support their families, some men found work with the mining companies who were staking their claim to the mineral wealth of the Southwest. World War II changed the lives of the Navajo forever. Some Navajo went to work in munitions factories. Others mined the uranium that was used to make the atomic bomb. Neither the government nor the mining companies warned them of the dangers of radiation. Thousands of Navajo went to war. Many distinguished themselves. An elite corps of Navajo, the Code Talkers, used their ancient language to create a code that was never broken by the Japanese. The Navajo word for potato became the code word for grenade. Egg meant bomb. They transmitted thousands of messages without error, making a major contribution to the Allied victory in the Pacific. When the war ended, the government continued to subsidize the defense industry in the West. As cities like Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Salt Lake were undergoing population explosions, their energy needs became excessive. The utility companies needed a new source of electric power. They began developing coal-fired power plants in the Four Corners region of the West. The idea there was to import energy from this remote area and to export the pollution and the health and environmental consequences of building these kinds of power plants. And this was the beginning of a very intense pressure that grew during the 1960s and 1970s on the resources on, on Indian lands. One third of the nation's strippable coal and half of its uranium is on Indian land. Much of this mineral wealth lies beneath the Hopi and Navajo reservations. Wanting to gain access to these resources, a Mormon lawyer named John Boyden tried to convince the Hopi to hire him as their attorney. Most Hopi refused to even meet with Boyden, knowing he wanted to strip mine their land. Boyden then held fraudulent elections in the Hopi villages. He persuaded the BIA to appoint him attorney to the Hopi Tribal Council. The traditional Hopi lost control over their land and life. By 1964, the first major mineral 
uh, contracts were signed with Peabody Coal. Uh, some $3 million uh, was given to the Hopi Tribal Council, of which their attorney, John Boyden, uh, received $1 million. So you can see that it was a rather lucrative client to have. The Boyden firm listed as its clients both the Hopi Tribal Council and Peabody Coal Company. Peabody Coal is the nation's largest coal producer. It is owned by six multinational corporations. Peabody signed leases with both the Hopi and the Navajo Tribal Councils and began stripping 12 million tons a year from the Arizona Plateau called Black Mesa. Black Mesa is a holy shrine to both Hopi and Navajo. Stripping her of her coal is as sacrilegious as bulldozing St. Peter's Basilica for its marble. Three hundred Navajo families lost their homes and grazing lands when the mine came in. They were neither consulted nor compensated. The pure air that once carried Indian prayers to the heavens is now dense with lead, mercury dioxides, and sulfuric acids. Vast networks of power lines crisscross their land. The Indians call the transmission towers white man's gods. 75% of the Navajo have no electricity themselves. Vast quantities of water are used in the process of converting coal to electricity. Every day through evaporation, 20 million gallons of water are wasted at one power plant alone. Scientists are now concerned that in draining the underground water supply, we are affecting the planet's balance. The native people spoke out against the destruction of the environment. We are facing a dangerous period ahead. If we do not stop, correct, and change some of these wrongdoings now, we are all going to suffer. Either things that we made will overtake us or nature will take over. Earthquake, flood, rain, Severe drought, severe winter, lightning destructive, great wind destructive. These things will warn us that we are not following the law of the great spirit. The Department of the Interior disregarded the pleas of the traditional people and urged the tribal councils to sign leases that were substantially below market value. The Navajo received 4% of the value of their coal, 1.3% of the value of their oil, 3.7% of the value of their uranium, and 1.8% of the value of their gas. In the case of one coal lease, the Navajo were paid 15 cents a ton, the price of a third of a bottle of soda pop. The Navajo should have been the richest minority in America, Instead, they remain one of the poorest. The average Navajo's income is less than $1,900 a year. 
I know we get money from uranium, from oil, from coal, from all of that, but none of us know how much money we, we get, and they are supposed to be Navajo money. The leasing of land, you know, very technically can take place without any consultation with anybody except the few elected leaders of, of the tribe. So that, you know, any small payout to any one person, you know, can carry a lot of weight. Lease revenues did not reach the people who most needed help. Men who had worked the uranium mines in the 40s were now dying of lung cancer. Neither they nor their widows have been compensated. I went to Washington two times. We need help to somehow. So we need uh, really help financial way. But I was even forget the Kermit Gideon tell us to how dangerous this thing. So all of my people and my husband they killed just like combat soldiers. They should think about more about safety this time. Another miner, Donald Rowe, built his house with the debris from a uranium mine. Donald built his house himself. They wouldn't know that it was dangerous. And Donald has the same with radiation too. He has a stroke from that. That's what the doctor said. He had, his thigh is paralyzed. We live in this house for 30 years. It's right from the middle of the mine. He gets us sick very often now. And we're, I'm sick today because of, it's too hot in the house and it gets worse. Kerr McGee, United Nuclear, and other mining companies have left thousands of tons of radioactive waste on and around the reservation. This debris will pollute the water and poison the air for 80,000 years. The birth defect ratio on the Navajo reservation is twice the national average. Exposure to radiation is the probable cause. Rather than face this reality, the Department of the Interior waived 13 of its own environmental protection regulations, urging the Tribal Council to approve another uranium lease. People will come around to the old people's homes, whether with an Indian man or Navajo man, they say, Grandma, put your thumbprint here, you'll get lots of money. They do that, and, and then the, the, the elderly person will think, well, why should they lie? They're Navajo, they're saying Grandma, they're, they're, they're saying, they're using all these relationship terms. And, and then they, five, six years lapse and all this drilling goes on, the, 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 the land's been ruined, there's nothing for the sheep to eat, and then after all this, the company will bring out like five bales of hay. This is for the damages that we caused you. The nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer, and the sacred tree is dead. It is no longer possible to separate environmental issues from Native American survival. The 1970s saw the birth of Indian activism. 100 years of surrender to the white man's will had brought nothing but poverty and humiliation to Indians and destruction to the earth itself. Indians began demonstrating, demanding that their treaty rights, their right to self-determination be respected. The Trail of Broken Treaties is a reflection that Indian people are no longer going to tolerate 
the kinds of conditions that we've been subjected to for the past 200 years. Four of the ten largest coal strip mines in the country are on Indian land. And we don't have that much land left. We got 4% of our original land base, but we're producing all that coal. And I don't like any of the people to be killed with, with the things that are dig from under our Mother Earth. The mother cannot kill any of her children. And we are all her children. The mood of the 1970s in Indian countries, this was the peak of Indian militancy, of Indian resistance, of Indian pride and assertion and red power. And uh, there were demonstrations at the Peabody Mine. Navajos, for a time, occupied the place. This created a climate of fear in southern Arizona that the Navajos were going to play hardball. The Navajo, living inside the Hopi reservation, shared control of the minerals with the Hopi. To gain control of as much of the minerals as possible, John Boyden proposed legislation that would divide the Hopi reservation between the two tribes. The Hopi Tribal Council, under John Boyden's control, hired a public relations firm to convince Congress to partition the land. They created a land dispute. A climate of hysteria was manufactured uh, back in the, in the early 1970s. Congress was made to believe that unless it intervened with this piece of legislation, there was going to be a bloodbath between the two tribes. The Navajos and the Hopis were about to go to war, and that Congress would have blood on its hands unless it uh, passed legislation that would stop this. Well, I mean, that's just patently false. At its very inception, the traditional Hopi leaders opposed the legislation, opposed the litigation that sought to partition and relocate and so forth. We want the world to know that it's not these Hopi leaders, Kikmongwis, traditional people, are involved in this kind of a plan to relocate the Navajos. Today you see all Indians all over the land all saying the same thing. This is our homeland. This is our birthright. They don't want any white man come in here and tell us that you have to divide this up this way or that way. The white man doesn't own this land. Just because he has a gun, he said, I took your land. Let's not forget, Peabody has a contract with both the Navajo and Hopi tribes to mine coal in this area. If Peabody does not have to relocate Navajos, if the Navajos are already gone, it makes their job easier. The dominant political figures who have been involved are Senator Barry Goldwater, former Senator Paul Fannin, and former Representative Sam Steiger, all of Arizona, all of whom had a great credibility back in Washington talking about a local Indian situation. Most people back in Washington could not presume to understand what was happening out here in a corner of Arizona, and they deferred to the presumed expertise of these three men. And these three men, it seems to me, distorted the situation terribly and misunderstood what was going on out here. I really don't think that the majority of the members of Congress understood exactly what the issue was. Harrison Lesh pushed the bill through Congress. He then left the Department of the Interior to become a vice president of Peabody Coal. Are we ready? Yes, sir. Ready, sir. Take Which one? In 1974, Congress passed Public Law 93531. President Gerald Ford signed the bill into law on a ski vacation in Vail, Colorado. Fencing along the new boundary line began at once. The cost to the taxpayer was $4,000 a mile. The cost to the native people was their way of life. This metal barrier, erected by bureaucrats, shattered the lives of the Navajo. It separated families and cut people off from their grazing lands, watering holes, and shrines. 
10,000 Navajo and 100 Hopi found themselves on the wrong side of a fence. Congress ordered them to relocate. Washington seems to be very immature. They believe in lies. They have no pity and cannot see us. We go around wiping our tears because of what they do. Because we don't count our plans and thoughts for walking forward into a good future have been taken from us. It seems as though our future has been beaten out of us with a stick. What is there to make us whole again? There's nothing. To force the Navajo out, the government began destroying the plants that the people depend on. Our mother is the earth. All the plants, whatever it's on, on earth is, some of it is our food and some are medicines and that's how we live on and uh, as though we are the children of our mother earth and how she feeds us is causing the whole thing we're going through we're going through suffering from everything that what the BIA is doing to my nation. See what you did to my people, see what you did to them? You took their very lives away from them. You better not it. The government says it takes 35 sheep to support a family of four. This same government is now reducing Navajo herds below subsistence level. By seizing Navajo livestock, the government is forcing many families into hunger and extreme poverty. They are taking our sheep away, trying to make us move. They are taking away everything that we need to live. That's what they're doing to us right now. They're trying to kill us one way or another slowly or fast. Of the first group of Navajo relocated, 25% of the adults are dead. Joel Ashki was emotionally disturbed by his grandfather's death. To restore Joel to balance, three generations of his family took part in a ceremony which lasted two days and a night. While the ceremony restored Joel's well-being, his family life has been ruptured and his culture continues to be destroyed. The American taxpayers are paying half a billion dollars to move 3,000 families into tract houses like these. Here it is not good for us. We have to pay for everything. 
electricity, water, the land, taxes. Here it is a small place. You can't go anywhere. It's like being in jail. Back there I had a good home, even though it was a hogan. There if you have sheep, you can use that as your food. Here there is none. There's not even one sheep around. I come out with nothing. I'm old and alone. It seems I miss it all. Well, there's a simplistic uh, view around that uh, relocation uh, uh, is, is harsh and that it's unusual and so on. People get relocated in America every day, and I don't want to compare troops, but uh, you, uh, the interstate highway system, uh, they go through your living room with a bulldozer in, in the interest of getting something settled and getting a highway where it has to go. So this isn't the only uh, place in an American system, in, in all phases of the American system. Somebody sometimes has to give up what they don't want. I was in Vietnam in 67, 68. I was a paratrooper over there. They told me, come and help us fight for your land and our land. They tried me to go over there. See, I fought for this land right here I'm standing on. <laughs> Chilson grew up with 11 brothers and sisters on land that had nourished three generations of his ancestors. His father died when they were young, but his mother kept the family together. I always wonder how she managed to brought all us up. She didn't speak no English and she didn't work. It was this land that the way my dad set it up for us that helped her. He built wells, and, you know, he planted trees. We used to have close to 300 heads of cattle. Chilson returned from Vietnam, married, and was raising his own family on the land when the Bureau of Indian Affairs seized most of his livestock. After the stock reduction, we've got to find a job to support ourselves. His herd confiscated, Chilson went to Flagstaff and became a mechanic. I used to drive back and forth, but that was 75 miles away, so I moved into town. We were renting in town, then they said, we don't live here anymore. To them, we, we don't exist here, even they told that to my mother. She used to stay here by herself. She almost froze because the fire was out and she got sick. So we don't let her stay here by herself anymore. The government claimed that since the McCabe's were not residing on the land, they were not eligible for replacement housing or assistance of any kind. Chilson was forced to move his mother into a trailer in Flagstaff, where she died of a broken heart. I blame my mother's death on, on this whole thing, relocation. See, they can destroy you know, a beautiful, loving family. Ever since my mother died, I had a dream about my mother being with me at home. And I always dream about the cattle. This uh, land dispute did uh, a lot of damage to me and my family because, you know, we've been cheated. We've been lied to. We've been called names. I get sick. I can't sleep at night. So I'm on my own now. I don't have any dream right now. The government took it away. The Diné people were forced to go to Fort Sumner. Washington said there won't be any more wars. These arms we will lay down. Then there was a world war. He asked for our children. Some of them never returned. So Washington broke that treaty. The Hopi and my late husband were good friends. We lived in harmony. 
Washington came and ruined it for us. He broke the law, and now he's demanding the land. Right now, police are hauling guns at Black Mesa and Big Mountain. Doesn't this Washington ever wake up? The politicians refused to repeal the law. They allowed relocation to continue. The white man does not understand the Indian for the reason that he does not understand America. The man from Europe is still a foreigner and an alien. But in the Indian, the spirit of the land is still vested. Men must be born and reborn to belong. Their bodies must be formed of the dust of their forefathers' bones. My roots is way down deep. It can't be pulled out. My great-great-grandmother is buried there, and grandmother and my mother, my father and brothers, and even my children, they're just buried just among where I am. So I just not able to live anywhere. I'm just going to remain. My father, he says, he used to say that he's part uh, Hopi. And so I'm part Hopi myself. It's all mixed blood, so you can't divide the blood by fencing. Unless the Navajo voluntarily leave the land, force may be used to remove them. The old people of the earth tell stories An old woman of the old ways She said I recall my joy in better Their only hope is that Public Law 93531 will be repealed. people will not move. They will fight for the only thing they have left, their sacred land.
the 